I think the thing too with like Gen Z, and I, you know, I kind of hate categorizing people by generations, but within you know more recent groups of youth, at any rate, is uh, I mean, first off, they are they are having less sex, you know, they they're or they're waiting to have sex later, and they're having sex less frequently, um, which is sort of interesting. It's also interesting to see how like you can't win because I remember ten years ago people were complaining that teens were having too much sex. Now they're <laughs> complaining teens are having too little sex. I mean, you can't you can't win. And people are just going to complain. <laughs> Welcome back to Chatting with Candace. I am back. We had a baby. I'm feeling a little bit refreshed, a little bit tired. I do have mom brain, so we're just going to lead with that. If the conversation on my end is a little bit clunky, I do apologize. This is the first time I'm talking to an adult at length in months that is not my husband. But please help me welcome Chris Ferguson. He has his PhD in psychology. He has been studying violent video games, the effects of media on us and we get into some really cool topics. So please enjoy the conversation and listen in. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming on the podcast. I was super excited when we kind of like virtually were introduced. I started a thread and um, I mean, we'll jump like into that, I'm sure in a little bit, but it was basically on like the effects of media and then a mutual friend tagged you. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've been wanting to talk about this because if I'm misinformed, so many other people are probably misinformed when it comes to like the effects of media, science, research, how a lay pa- person reads all of this. There's just like so many questions that I have for you. Awesome. Well, th- yeah, thanks for having me on today. I'm really excited to talk about this. Do you want to give the listeners like a quick background as um, like your credentials as far as your credentials go? Yeah, sure. I, I can certainly try. <laughs> so I'm a, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm a psychology professor at Stetson University, which is in right outside of Orlando, uh, kind of the area that just went underwater in the recent hurricane. Um, so it's right about there. Um, I've had my PhD since 2004. And I initially was doing research more with like violent crime. And it was kind of as a accidental backdoor from being interested in like mass homicide, essentially, that kind of got me interested into the video game stuff because there was a lot of talk. This is like, yeah, you know, early 2000s. There's a lot of talk about Columbine High and, and all that and how that related to video games. So that sort of got me interested in this topic. And it turns out it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to do research on video games than it is on mass homicide perpetrators. So it ended up being, I guess, you know, lucrative probably isn't quite the right word for it, but certainly very productive as a research field. And it's a lot of fun, um, you know, so uh, that's basically it. I mean, I've, I've testified in D.C. a few times. I got to meet then Vice President uh, Joe Biden. I don't think he'd remember me, uh, <laughs> probably for, for more reasons than one. Uh, but, uh, you know, so and uh, I actually was called by the Trump administration to uh, for their school safety commission back in 2018 after the Parkland shooting here in Florida. So I've, 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 I've given testimony on a few times in D.C., but, uh, you know, it's, it's a living. Uh, it keeps me off the streets. When you were working with, I guess you were working with criminals, right? Like that was part of your forensic psychology. Can you tell me a little mm-hmm. bit about that? Because so I, um, I went to university for psychology and I was convinced that's what I was going to do. I was like, I want to interview serial killers like the FBI does. I just found it so fascinating. And my teachers at the time were really concerned. And they're like, I don't know if you should be researching these subjects or if you should be diving deep because you might be losing sleep. And for some reason, it never really scared me. It just was so fascinating that you get into the conversation of consciousness and souls and um, empathy and whether all of these things exist in all people. So what was that like for you? Did you lose sleep? Did you just find it fascinating? Like, how did you um, get through that? I think about one third of our students probably get involved in psychology for exactly the same reason as you did. So you're you're in good company. So they're definitely, it's it's not a unusual uh, motivation for people to go into psychology. And it it really, of course, was a large part of my motivation as well, because I always found those things interesting. Now, I'm I'm actually pretty difficult to disturb, I think, Uh, you know, so I try to think of the right word of saying it, but but like, like when we watch horror movies, like my wife and I, you know, my wife is is always a lot more like, you know, I, I can't stand what's happening to those people. And I'm like, I don't know. I think it's kind of fun to watch this. I don't know. So I guess that's kind of the difference a little bit. So anyway, I, I talk about serial killers and mass homicide perpetrators. It doesn't really bother me. It never really did. I never lost sleep over it. I mean, it, 
obviously be very different to see something like that happen in person. But, you know, in, in the abstract, at least, it isn't really a bothersome um, sort of thing for me. But, uh, but, I, but I really didn't, you know, but most of my stuff was I worked with juvenile sex offenders for a little while. I've worked with juveniles in general in juvenile detention facilities. I did screening for inmates in a, in a jail for a while. And then really my, my latest or my last clinical gig I don't do a lot of clinical work anymore, but my last clinical gig was uh, working with Child Protective Services. So that was a lot of parents who had lost custody of their children and wanted to, you know, a lot, but probably the majority of them were mothers and they wanted to you know, regain custody of their children. So as part of that, they had to go through a psychological evaluation in order to, you know, determine the risk of them reoffending or not protecting. A lot of it was not protecting their kids from being offended against. Um so that was kind of like the stuff that I, 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 I wish I could say, like, you know, I was hunting serial killers, you know, or, or something like that. But that really wasn't. <laughs> I did occasionally get to talk to a serial killer, but uh, relatively rare. Uh, and, and that was still just as a kind of routine part of they were already incarcerated and, you know, just may, trying to figure out if they needed to be in the mental health unit or something of that sort, as opposed to general population. It wasn't like criminal minds. I wasn't in a, like a private plane jetting all over the place trying to capture some unknown suspect or whatever. But it was still was fun. I, I like doing it clinically. I like doing assessments. I don't like doing therapy very much. Um, so it's a lot of fun to you know have these questions about what makes people work and, and go through the process of collecting evidence through a psychological assessment and you know trying to answer whatever question people have, whether that's a diagnosis question or is it a at risk question or whatever else may be happening. So if you're thinking of, you know, for any listeners who may be thinking of psychology or think they hate therapy, you can do assessments. That's a lot more fun. It feels a little bit more like the scientific side of, of clinical work. So, yeah. So when you're coming up with the assessments, do you find a commonality in the people that have been incarcerated for violent crimes or a commonality in whether it's like the mom or the parents that are losing custody because like they're not taking care of the kid? Like, is there like, you know, the dr dark triad? Is that does that show up in both or is there a commonality in like lack of empathy or maybe a predisposition to violence that you see? Yeah. Well, it kind of depends on what type of crime you're talking about, you know, in terms of like, you kind of think of like mass homicide, which I spent a lot of time studying, you know, for instance, you do see a really common pattern of those individuals tend to have a long history of mental health problems. Uh, they tend to be antisocial. Yeah, it's probably not a surprise. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be what we call injustice collectors, which means they just ruminate over all the wrong things other people have done to them and they just can't let it go. So, you know, so, and that's what, you know, eventually results in the mass homicides. They just, they just want to punish everyone that they think is responsible for how bad their life has turned out. Um, you know, so, you know, if you kind of like think of that extreme, you see a relatively, you know, clear, for lack of a better word, profile of what those individuals look, if you look like, you know, if you're thinking about like, on the other hand, like shoplifting, you know, yeah, um, you know, <laughs> probably a, a majority of teenagers shoplift at some point, you know, mm -hmm. so trying to distinguish between them is a little bit trickier. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so with sort of like a, an assault, you know, you, you get a relatively wide range of, you know, so you can't say that everybody that's committed an assault fits necessarily into a nice package. Uh, but you tend to see that, you know, people that come from you know, more difficult backgrounds, uh, tend to be more likely to commit assaults. You know, again, I know people hear a lot to the contrary, but it actually is true that people with certain types of mental illnesses are more likely to commit assaults uh, than other individuals, people who are stressed financially or otherwise. You know, so you do kind of see these sort of things that make, you know, uh, violent crimes more likely. But of course, not everybody who's in those categories commits violent crimes. Not, you know, not everybody's poor commits an assault or has schizophrenia commits an assault. And not everybody who commits an assault comes from those categories. So it's a little bit trickier, the more general or more mild the, the criminal behavior happens to be. You see less of a profile the further down the scale you go. Probably all of us commit some kind of crime, you know, at some point. You know, and I'm going to have my students speculating about what types of crime I've committed um, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, there were other faculty members at one point were, were like spreading the rumor that I've been arrested at some point in my life. I actually have not been, for the record, ever been arrested. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, probably most of us have like downloaded MP3s or shoplifted or done something relatively small uh, that was still bad, you know, at some point in our lives because we're we're human. So no, totally. So everyone at least has ripped like a like you said an MP3 or a movie back in the day. <laughs> that was everyone was guilty of that, and that's 
Mm -hmm. that's horrible. Don't do that. But um, yeah, whether the scale is something victimless like that or something something much larger. I think so I like a lot of people have I guess the false narrative that um v- like video games in particular or violent modeling through like movies um maybe even play can create a more violent child and then they're more likely to um to be a perpetrator of something like this. And then one of the mm-hmm. one of the experiments that they used to show us back in school like eons ago is the bobo dolls right so it's mm-hmm. like well this is proof that you know something like a video game could um could make someone more violent is you you give these kids something to watch they see someone like whacking someone with a hammer and then they're acting violent towards this bobo doll so i guess where how have we gone from that where it was widely accepted that modeling does create violent behavior to no it does not yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, and and the, the Boba dolls happened. Yeah, you know, those experiments happened like back in like 1962. So they you know, practically brought these like cave children in to you know uh, to watch these videos. But yeah, they would have these kids like watch videos, and half they'd be randomized, and half of them would watch a video in which an adult went into this playroom and played peacefully with the toys that were in the playroom, and the other half watched this adult grab a mallet and swat a bobo doll, right? You know, and so of course the kids who watch the video, then the kids are all brought into that room and they get to play with whatever plays they, toys they want to. And of course the kids that watch the video of the adult swatting the bobo doll with the mallet are more likely to do that than themselves. And yeah, you're obviously right. It sort of has been interpreted, you know, as sort of evidence that kids will model and learn aggression by watching you know, some, some sort of adult engaging in, you know, similar behavior. I mean, some of the things that kind of are getting pointed out, though, about those experiments are, first off, Bobo dolls are meant to be hit. I mean, it's like, they're like, they have no other purpose other than to be hit. And that's different from like, a kitten, right? You know, so I always kind of say, you know, just to show you how morbid I am. I say like, the experiment that would convince me it was completely illegal and unethical, of course, would be to show children a video of an adult smashing a kitten with a hammer right and then bring the kids into the room and see if they do something that is not socially sanctioned my best guess obviously i don't actually think anybody should do this experiment because it's horrible i actually love kittens but uh for the record (laughs) it's not like a a fantasy i'm having uh but but that would be more on target with what we actually want to know because you're actually talking about a non-socially sanctioned behavior as opposed to one that perfectly is sanctioned. Anybody can hit a bobo doll. Nobody cares. Right. You know? um, and the other thing that's kind of pointed out is that these studies, the bobo studies, are probably not really aggression studies at all. They're probably compliance studies that these kids were given no other instructions. You know, they were like three or four, you know, and they were brought into this room and showed a video of an adult doing a thing and then brought into a room that had the things they could do the same thing with. And lacking any other instructions and having the strange adult in a lab coat, you know, sort of guiding them around, probably guessed that the video was the instructions for what they were supposed to be doing. So it's probably more like a compliance study that these kids were trying to make the adults happy, not engaging in aggression. And, you know, the types of aggression we are worried about tend to be more antisocial aggression where you're not trying to make somebody happy. Yeah. So there really have been these questions that have emerged about whether the Bobo Dow studies really ever taught us anything about aggression at all, as opposed to like just kids will try to figure out what you want them to do, you know, uh, which we already knew, you know, for the most part at that age, you know, it'd be different if it was teenagers, right? Teenagers don't want to do what they think you want them to do, but it's a, it's a very different story. Um, but yeah, so it, it turns out in reality, like, you know, aggression, you know, it's not that you don't ever learn it, but a large part of it actually is genetic. You know, something about 50 to 55 percent of the variance in antisocial behavior in particular is is genetic. And it, it is important to sort of also point out that not all aggressive behavior is antisocial, you know, that there are certain things like debating people. Uh, or defending yourself or engaging in sports aggression and that kind of stuff, we actually allow people to do and actually mm-hmm. praise them for doing it. So, but in terms of like antisocial aggression, about 50 to 55% of that variance is, is genetic. Most of what remains is really more emotional than it is learned. In other words, the more stressed a person is, the more likely they are to engage in aggression. 
Uh, there certainly are some aspects of things like if you come from a bad background where you see your parents engage in a lot of aggression either towards each other or towards you as the child, you may be more likely to engage in, in aggressive behavior. But these things like television and video games are just too far removed you know, from all that stuff. There's just no real emotional connection uh, for the most part between people and these forms of media. So it's just like we call it too distal. It's just it's just too remote for it turns out people are bad at learning in general you know so this like it's just not that great a learning opportunity uh for the most part and the way sometimes it helps people think about it is a sense of like if you were getting on a jet plane a, a passenger airliner and the pilot came over the intercom and said this is my first time ever flying an actual plane but I've been playing Microsoft Flight Simulator for 10,000 hours, and I'm pretty sure I've got this down. It, everything looks pretty much the same. Most of us would be stampeding to get off that plane, you know, because we understand that, you know, learning in the environment of a video game is very different from engaging in the behavior um, in, uh, in real life. And we would have no confidence that this person has actually learned to fly a plane uh, simply by jumping from a flight simulator um, into an actual cockpit without anybody giving them further instruction in real life before, you know, doing so. So, and that's what we've seen. This we call it transfer of learning. That for the most part, people don't engage in transfer of learning. So they don't learn things in one context and apply them to another one. Um, in some ways, that's bad. It would be very efficient if we did. But in other cases like this is good, right? Because we don't want people to take what they learn in a video game and place it to to real life. And it turns out. For the most part, they don't. That's true whether we're talking about bad things like aggression or violence. Unfortunately, it's also true when we're talking about good things like learning pro-social behavior or moral values or things like that. People don't learn that either. So <laughs> video games are just fun. They, they don't really teach us much for the most part. So there's no like so I guess what what triggers, I guess, that empathetic response do you know like is there a difference between when they see a character on the screen like let's say they're playing resident evil and they're shooting down zombies yeah what how does the, the brain especially of like a younger child or maybe like a you know prepubescent teenage like 12 13 year old how do they distinguish the difference between the screen and real life yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, and of course, in fairness, like young children aren't really empathic creatures at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, empathy is something that develops kind of across the lifespan until at least the teenage years. You know, so you can just watch how children on the playground behave with each other and they're horrible. They're like geese. You know, there's mean and spiteful and uh, aggressive, you know, with each other. That's kind of a normal way that they, they behave. But there does seem to be something in terms of, you know, our brains make some distinction about whether we think what we're watching is real or is not real. And we assign value to that. And it seems to be a part of our brain called the amygdala that, that there, there actually have been these like fMRI scans, uh, which are sometimes kind of sketchy. But, you know, uh, you know, this, these are kind of interesting in, in the sense that they, they look at like people viewing real scenarios versus fictional scenarios and see that this particular part of the brain which is involved in assigning emotional meaning to memories um, lights up more basically when the event is real, as opposed to when the event is fictional. Um, so it's, again, it suggests that we're giving a different emotional weight to real versus fictional, you know, things. And, uh, and we actually showed that in one experiment we did not with an fMRI machine, but we had people watch these were young adults and we had them watch either violent or nonviolent television shows and then after that, we had them watch either clips of real people dying or getting injured or closely matched clips of fictional like movies or television shows where people were dying or getting injured. And they knew it. They knew they were watching either real people or, you know, the, the, the TV shows. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then they were asked about their empathy towards those people they watched. We were watching get injured or killed or whatever. And, um, and first of all, it didn't matter if they'd watched a violent television show or not beforehand. That didn't cause any differences in empathy. Um, but what did cause, you know, probably not a surprise, differences in empathy is that people were much more empathic towards the real victims of violence uh, than they were the fictional characters. You know, they really just didn't care for the most part about the fictional characters. They really were upset, though, by watching real people 
die or or get injured. So I think that's pretty phenomenal. Pretty fantastic. You know, pretty interesting, really. Yeah, pretty fantastic that we seem to have this sense of being able to apply meaning to things, but whether we think it's real or fictional or not, I don't think it's really well understood exactly how we do that necessarily. And I think it's unfortunate because until very recently, there really was this, this sort of sense that we didn't do that, you know, because, you know, we would watch a television show and watch people get killed over and over and over again, and then reduce empathy, you know, we will lose our empathy for real life violence. It turns out that doesn't happen. Um, and so we don't know why exactly it doesn't happen, but we can show that, in fact, it, it doesn't happen, that we maintain our empathy, you know, towards real life events, no matter what we watch in the, in the fictional world. And again, you kind of, you know, take the average person who likes to watch a lot of thrillers or horror movies or whatever else, you know, I, I, I love these kinds of movies. And uh, I've, you know, as many people have, I've watched countless people have their heads blown off or eaten by monsters or, or whatever else. And, you know, you get a little thrill. It's kind of exciting and fun. But I mean, to have someone walk into the room with me and shoot another person in the head would be horror. I mean, incredibly traumatic, even if I wasn't in any way in any danger. It'd be a really, really very different experience, um, you know. And so, again, I don't think this sense of like, well, I've seen it in a bunch of movies, therefore, blah, not that big a deal, is really how people respond, you know, to uh, to these things. It's, it's too mechanical and we're just not that mechanistic. Wasn't that a, a, a story? Was that the military used um, video games, like violent video games or violent simulation to desensitize soldiers? It, yeah, it was exactly what you said. It was a story. <laughs> it was okay. a myth. It was it was not a thing that actually happened. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 army or the military in general do use simulators. You know, they do use video game like simulators to train things like you know, v, you know how to use vehicles, uh, how to do team you know team performance uh, sorts of things. Uh, the police use shooting simulators to try to teach police officers when to shoot, when not to shoot, things like that. So people do use these kind of like video game like um, simulators, but no, they don't use them to desensitize um, people to kill more. I mean, obviously, the police don't want to, you know, have their officers shoot everybody. You know, the whole point of this thing is to try to help them not engage in wrongful shootings. Uh, same thing with the military. And I actually did at one point interview, a, I think it was an Air Force uh, psychologist about sort of this. And I think he kind of laughed when he uh, heard about this story and uh, in, in a sense of like you know, why would you think the the u.s army wants to send their soldiers shooting everybody because imagine what would happen they just start opening fire on everybody you know uh, in the streets with no discernment whatsoever if this was really what was happening and why would you think that any professional military would want their soldiers doing that you know it's, it's a recipe for you know, it's, I mean, we kind of look at the Ukraine war. It's kind of what the Russians are doing. I know to some extent they look bad. It looks bad when your soldiers do this sorts of things. So it absolutely is not what you want a professional military to do is to just, you know, open fire on everybody without any sense of remorse whatsoever. You want to train them cognitively about what to do in dangerous situations that maximizes their own survival you know, moves the mission forward, but without, you know, uh, engaging in civilian casualties or, or hurting people that you know, are not threats, because that ends up causing more problems for the military than it does anything good. So do you think that any kind of content can, I guess, influence the ethical behavior or like the ethical way that you handle firearms? So it's interesting because Growing up, I feel like the conversation used to be that um, it was video games and rap music that caused school shootings. And now the conversation is, well, it's Hollywood movies, too. I saw that a lot during the most um, recent shooting that was in Texas. And Mm. everyone was saying, well, Hollywood has no right to say anything because they practice unsafe gun protocol all the time in all their movies. And what I've noticed is in a couple of movies, um, they've actually changed a little bit. Like it seems like they're trying to behave like they have real weapons now. So mm-hmm. the one show is called, uh, I think it was called The Gray Man. Did you watch that? I have not seen it now. So like he's like throwing the, these weapons to people and then like the, the, the joke of it all was that they weren't loaded and he's like why why would you throw me this weapon like there's no bullets and he's like everyone knows you don't throw a loaded gun. Like little like drops there of like well this is how you properly handle a firearm. Does that make right. any difference or is it kind of in the same field as video games? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, not throwing a loaded gun sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> I would say that, but um, no, it's probably not going to have much impact, unfortunately. And and the reason I say that, uh, in terms of even in terms of things like gun safety, it's really not going to influence. Probably first off, because I don't think a lot of people really throw around live firearms. I mean, I know it's a big world, and probably there's some idiots out there somewhere that do stuff like this. But I imagine the average gun owner isn't like juggling their AR-15s or something of that sort with the safety off, you know. So, um, but there, there have been experiments that, you know, again, with this idea that people are really bad learners. So they, they do these experiments sometimes with kids uh, with gun safety. And they're, again, like kindergarten, first grade, second, like young kids, you know, and they'll teach them the basics of gun safety, which is like, you know, if you see a firearm, don't touch it, go tell an adult, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, pretty simple messages for the most part. And what you find is that you can, you can teach people, you can teach kids to repeat this stuff, right? You know, so you, you take a bunch of these kids, you have a little class of maybe 10 or 12 kids. And you say, what do you do if you find a, a, a firearm? You know, they tell an adult, they all say the right thing. And then you leave them in the room by themselves and you go behind a two-way mirror and somewhere in this room, you've hidden a real firearm. Uh, of course, it doesn't, you know, and, and there are bullets too, but of course, all the gunpowder is taken off of the bullets, so the kids can't really hurt themselves, but they don't know that. It's not a toy. It's a real, like, they, they had like a 38, you know, and the wow. bullet's hidden somewhere. There. And of course, the kids find the 38, and they find the bullets. They get all these beautiful videos of these kids, like, with the 38 in their hand, squeezing the trigger, oh, you know. Wow. They find the bullets, and because they're all, like, six, they don't know how to load a pistol, but they're all trying to, like, jam the bullets down the barrel and this kind of stuff to try to load them. So... You can teach kids the words, but they don't do the behavior uh, very effectively, you know, so that's, and I'm not saying we shouldn't teach kids gun safety. It just points out that you're working against some aspects of human nature that are very irrational, I think, uh, to, to some extent, you know, so, you know, I, I think it's helpful to, to teach those messages. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, people are just kind of bad at learning stuff. So I, I, yeah, I don't think for the most part, that like the messages in movies are going to have much impact on like people's real behavior, even moral messages for the most part don't tend to have a lot of impact. It's sort of like with safe sex. I mean, you can have your characters talk about, Oh, you know, we're, we're going to go to bed, but make sure we have a condom or whatever. You know, and I don't think that's really like at the core of teaching teens safe sex or, or anything of that sort, you know? So I think you really have to do that in families and maybe schools may have a bit more impact there, but still you're working against biology to some extent. So some of these teens are still going to have unsafe sex and that's just kind of how it goes. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think, you know, trying to, the other thing about like moral messages too, if they come across too obvious, they'll kind of backfire in a way because people really don't like to be preached to mm -hmm. in their fictional media. And sometimes you can try to subtly put a few things in there, but if they pick up on it, what I think is what's happening in a lot of shows right now is people are kind of complaining about like this show is really trying to preach to me. They may not be putting it quite uh, as, you know, neutrally as that, but I think that's the worst. Where... You have a show that you're invested in and it's been great. And then all of a sudden it gets political and you're like, this was my form of escape and entertainment and now you're trying to push your yeah. ideologies onto me when I really loved the show and I loved the characters. Um, yeah, I saw that happening a lot too. And then what I have noticed is they all got rid of it really quick because yeah. all of my <laughs> friends, we were watching This Is Us and it is one of the most beautiful shows, I think, on TV, but it got crazy political for like a few episodes and then quickly, yeah. quickly turned around yeah. and everyone stopped watching it. Like, you can't yeah. do this. This is not what it's, we signed up for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that could be true even if you, I mean, I remember like Law and Order at SVU it was one of my favorite shows for a long time. And I actually stopped watching it maybe maybe two or three years ago for exactly the same reason that you're talking about. All of a sudden it was, I actually agreed morally with where they're coming from because they were, you know, I'll be very uh, upfront with you and I don't know, like, you know, I, I'm not trying to get into pol politics with you, but uh, I, I guess Dick Wolf was very anti-Trump, you know, so a lot of the episodes really became the sort of like anti-Trump message. And uh, and I didn't vote for Trump, um, you know, at, uh, either time. <laughs> I don't, don't care for him uh, in any way. But still, I was like, man, I'm just trying to relax. You know, I just want to watch a good mystery or good police procedural here. I don't want to, even though I mostly agree with the moral message, it just feels 
way too earnest, you know, way too in my face. And it's sometimes it's okay to like want to be able to turn to media and not think about politics, you right. know, either side for a while. We, we, we need more opportunities to take a break yeah. from all the stupid fighting in politics. And it, yeah. And I don't know if, if law and order SVU is still doing that. Like I said, I, there was maybe like three, four, five episodes that were all pretty closely packed together. And I was like, Oh, forget it. I, I don't, I don't, I, I can watch this on CNN. Oh. <laughs> I wanted this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think when it, you're faced with the same, problems and there's no escape from it i think it just helps just pit everyone against one another it's like kind of like what you see with the war and the sexes is seems to be being given a new life so it's like this idea Mm. of men versus women and i forget who says it. i think it might have been the author of that older book women are from men are from mars women are from venus like if if you're trying to like prop up one sex, they both lose. Like this isn't yeah. we're not supposed to be at each other's throats. Like we're supposed to be teammates. Um, and I think it's the same with like red and blue. I think you're there as checks and balances. I don't think there's inherently a good and a, a bad team. I think it's like if red is getting a little bit crazy, blue's there to check them. If blue gets a little bit too crazy, red's there to check them. Like we have to have this balance between conservatism, conservative values and progressive values, right? Because you want to progress. You want to, you know, um, constantly be innovating, but not to the point where you start getting crazy. And then you also want to conserve some things, but not to the point where it's affecting your growth. So I think when we are looking at it as like them versus us, it's like everybody loses. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's good. It's good newspaper headlines though. I think it's, it is. is what it is. You know? So there are obviously certain groups of people that do benefit from that messaging. Obviously the politicians themselves can benefit um, to some degree. And uh, but also, you know, news media love this stuff. I mean, probably, you know, talking about Trump again, and I don't mean to go down that rabbit hole too far, but, you know, probably nobody has been better for news media in recent memory than Donald Trump, as much as they ostensibly hated him, uh, other than Fox News, of course. He was good business for CNN, you know, like Mm -hmm. they gave him so much free publicity, you know, by complaining about him all the time. And he was just smart enough to turn that to his advantage uh, and, uh, you know, get a lot of voters behind him. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, and then and social media, of course, you know, these platforms tend to do well by increasing polarization and, you know, uh, tapping people's hot buttons and this sort of stuff. So I, I think, you know, there are certain groups of elites, I guess, and I use that term with some hesitation, but um, that benefit from dividing everybody else, whether it's on mm-hmm. race, whether it's on gender, whether it's on you know religion, national identity, whatever, all these different identity politics types of issues, you know, you know I, th- I think I've seen this argument made, I think it's convincing that the, the best way of keeping the lower classes, the working classes from having any actual power is to put them against each other, you know, black versus white versus Latino, you know, male versus female, so on and so forth. So they're all arguing with each other rather than figuring out that they're all kind of getting screwed <laughs> by you know, people further up the chain. 100%. Uh, so, uh, yeah. No, I totally agree. There's this joke about it and it's, you have, there's like these two puppets and um, one side is like, well, I I like the puppet on the right hand side, and the other one's like, well, I like the puppet on the left hand side, and then come to find out it's the same hand holding both of them, and it's like yeah. you're <laughs> exactly the same, you dummies. Like focus yeah. focus somewhere else. Um, <laughs> you did say something interesting. So when you were getting to like the safe sex discussion, um, I'm not sure if this is like in your wheelhouse or not, but when it comes to identifying the differences between simulated and like real occurrences like we were talking about with like the violence is that the same when it comes to sex so like because pornography is real like it's actually happening is that also can that have an influence like a negative influence on how people perceive you're supposed to behave so like kind of like the violence argument but just more sexual ethics because it's not simulated versus like a really hot sex scene in a movie where it's not real but it's really close to real but it's not real yeah that's a good question and i think there really are kind of like two different levels in which to try to answer that and the answer might be slightly different Based on them. So obviously the one thing people worry about probably more than anything else is just the sort of idea, does it, does it lead to rape or sexual assault or other kinds of right. sexual violence? And I think there we can pretty clearly say that at least for most like mainstream porn, so if you're showing like a 
heterosexual couple having sex and it's consenting or a homosexual couple having sex and it's consenting. No, that is not just, just watching people having sex doesn't increase the, the likelihood of like rape or, or sexual assault or yeah, there's a lot of theories about the sort of idea of commodifying women and this kind of stuff and objectifying and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, on a moral level, maybe we could say there are elements of porn that are objectionable, but in terms of practical impacts, you know, watching the va- vast majority of pornography does not seem to be associated with increased rates of, of rape or sexual assault. If anything, it's somewhat the inverse. If, this is correlational data, so I'm not making a causal attribution here, but as societies genuinely liberalize in terms of allowing more pornography, things like rape and sexual assault rates tend to go down in those uh, same societies. Now, that's probably just because of a general liberalizing trend, not anything that porn is doing. Uh, but on the other hand, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, uh, so I would, you know, don't mess with the system that's moving in the in the right direction. Um, if you look at like violent porn, now there's a lot of like so the way people define violent porn in academia is different, also from how like the average like normal person thinks of violent porn. So things like if you're showing a scene where like a man is forcing himself onto a woman, now they might be actors, you know, they may be all simulated. Uh, but she appears to be not enjoying it. She's saying no, you know, this kind of stuff. That's actually really rare. It still is, they, they, obviously the, it exists. There's a niche market for it. Most men who enjoy porn don't want that, you know. Um, so with that, you find some small correlations between viewing that type of stuff. And um, so if you look at like rapist or sexual assault perpetrators who are convicted, they tend to have, they tend to report at least a history of consuming more of that type of material. Now it's not really clear though. Does that mean that the porn made them that way or were they already psychopaths who are interested in violent sex and therefore they're attracted to pornography that portrays that sort of thing. That's, and that's what we don't really know very clearly uh, at this point, but in terms of like the 95% of porn that like most people consume naked images of adults uh, adults having consenting sex where both people seem to be enjoying it. Um, that's not associated with anything in terms of rape or sexual assault. The other thing people, the other level people sometimes ask, well, what about, does it make some activities more normal seeming? You yeah. know, in other words, did porn result in like people having more oral sex, you know, or people perhaps having more anal sex or things like that, or more, you know, uh, S&M or bondage or, you know, um, and it's hard to know, you know, did it sort of, it, it probably had the effect of allowing people to talk about it more, mm. um, you know, so thinking like oral sex I mean, oral sex was not invented in the 1970s, you know, you know, so, but people probably didn't talk a lot about it up until relatively recently. And even in things like anonymous surveys, people might've been, because people do lie in anonymous surveys, people might've been shyer about talking about those things than they are. You know, today I could I could say like with my even with my undergraduates I could tell they're much franker in talking about sex than I would have been as an undergraduate even thirty years ago. Um, so there definitely are these generational changes in how upfront people are in terms of talking about like masturbation, oral sex, and other kinds of activities. I, again, I don't know that it's necessarily the case that you know. Again, I don't think most sex acts have been invented by porn. You know, <laughs> so. Um, but, you know, is, is there kind of an increase in some of these activities resulting from the more widespread availability of porn? I, I don't think we know for sure, you know, is, uh, is the reality of it. Uh, I don't think it's the main driving force, but maybe it has a minor impact um, a little bit. Again, in terms of like normalizing these things of making it seem like they're not as big a deal as maybe 50, 60 years ago, people would have thought of them. There are other myths around porn too. Like, you know, like porn doesn't cause men to have erectile dysfunction. That's another one. I hear. Say it again for the people in the back. <laughs> porn does not cause men to have erectile dysfunction. Oh <laughs> my no gosh. I, that. I hope that audio clip goes viral. I've had um, Dr. Nicole Prousey on and uh, Dr. Lay on and just Dr. So on all of these people that know what they're talking about. And there are plenty of studies that have debunked that myth. And for some reason, it's like these Gen Z men that are like swearing oaths of abstinence, like not even like no porn, but they're not masturbating. They're not having sex um, with men or with women because they have this idea that it's perpetuating ED and lowering their testosterone, which is quite the opposite. It's like if you if you aren't having those releases, you are going to continue to have ED because now you're psyching yourself out and there's this this kind of waterfall effect that you're 
perpetuating onto yourself. Um, but it's not the porn and it's not the women and it's not the yeah. dating apps. It's it's in your own noggin. But um, for some reason, we have like these crusaders <laughs> out there that are just trying to yeah. get rid of porn or um, are very anti women, and they're just they're blaming all of all of those for something that's that's not going to be beneficial. All of those kind of like 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 dopamine detox is another similar mm-hmm. thing. All, all these ideas that you have to sort of uh, withhold pleasure from yourself in order to I don't know what I don't know what the outcome is supposed to be be somehow healthier down the road is is uh, I keep in mind we, we only get like somebody calculated it's something like thirty thousand days you know we get like thirty thousand days in our lives and that might be the wrong number but it's something around there you know if you if you start you know, wasting them by the dozens <laughs> to, to deprive yourself of fun. I mean, the, the, the reward for all of us is six feet of dirt, you know, at the end of it, no matter how virtuously we live. And, you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't live virtuously, but, you know, if we go overboard and actually start depriving ourselves, where we're just making, we're purposely making ourselves miserable for some number of days of our lives. And, there, and in particular, if there's no actual health benefit, uh, from this sort of thing, which there is not uh, from these sorts of activities. Uh, I just think you're, you know, sort of like throwing money down the toilet. You're just throwing days of your life down the grave, basically, you know. So, no, go ahead, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying too. I think it, there's like this weird inherent distrust that people are having in themselves. So it's like, mm. well, if I, I can't trust myself to in, to enjoy anything, I can't trust myself with pleasure, whether that's like, sexually or like the intimacy of someone else or if it's with food like people get crazy with food now too it's like we have to be able to trust that we can moderate our the things that bring us joy like not to yeah. overindulge and to me the be- the best way it's like exercise like resistance training like you have to have some kind of exposure or something to push back at versus just like complete abstinence because to me that's kind of like the lazy way out it's like it's yeah. very easy not to be te- by not to be tempted by something that's not there versus learning to how how to like um, mitigate that if that makes sense yeah it does yeah I think the thing too with like Gen Z and I, you know I kind of hate categorizing people by generations but within you know more recent groups of youth at any rate is uh, I mean first off they are they are having less sex you know they they or they're waiting to have sex later and they're having sex less frequently um. Which is sort of interesting. It's also interesting to see how, like, you can't win. Because I remember 10 years ago, people were complaining that teens were having too much sex. Now they're <laughs> complaining teens are having too little sex. I mean, you can't you can't win. People are just going to complain. <laughs> people are just going to complain no matter what. Um, but I, I think there is a sense, at least in some sub-communities of youth. I don't know that, like, the average kid necessarily is tapped into this. But... Yeah, there, there seems to be a vibe, at least in some sub communities, that like sex is dangerous. You know that they've removed the. There's a lot of talk about gender and sexual identity, but there's also the sort of vibe that like sex is unfun and dangerous. And and again, some of that I think is fair in the sense of like obviously issues around consent. You want to make sure both partners are having a good time and this kind of stuff, and everybody's on board. And so having discussions about that, I think, is very fair. But I think it's kind of the pendulum has swung a lot in the opposite direction of being too licentious in the sense of now everybody's like on their tippy toes of, you know, on one hand, you know, for, for women, every sexual encounter might degenerate into an assault. And for men, every sexual encounter might degenerate into a criminal charge or or at least a Title IX investigation or something of that sort. You know, so I think. Again, that was in response to real problems. You know, I don't want to discredit that, but I think it also has created this sense of around sexuality for some younger people today that it's a much more dangerous activity where, you know, again, even 30 or 40 years ago, when we were learning about safe sex for our, my generation was learning about safe sex. You know, the people like, yeah, make sure you wear a condom, make sure the girl says yes. You know, uh, so there were a few of those messages that yeah, I think they were fine messages, but there wasn't the sense of like, you know, you if you if you if you have sex with someone, you're going to die uh, or your life will be ruined or like everybody you're going to have sex with possibly is trying to destroy your life. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think there's been this really kind of erosion in trust, as you said, both in ourselves to some extent, but also in our ability to communicate with other people. And, you know, and, and have this sense of being able to have a mutually pleasurable, fun experience with another person 
and be able to do that without having a written contract practically, you know, oh make gosh. sure mm-hmm. and, and lawyers involved and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and every step, you know, I'm going to touch your left shoulder now. Is that okay? You know, and all the stuff that, you know, seems to be, yeah, we, we, we made fun. I remember Saturday night live literally making fun of this like 15, 20 years ago. And now it's just kind of how like the, uh, a lot of the younger people think sex should be. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, Yuck, I, I understand where it came from. That way and all of the excitement, you can't, you have to have a little bit of um, like mystery. Like, is this going to happen? Is he going to kiss me? Is he going to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like not the, here's <laughs> sign on the dotted line. That way everyone's happy. That's, that's crazy to me. Like, obviously we're all, again, it goes back to like, um, not trusting ourselves or I guess our partners, but like breeding social cues. You should be able to mm. very much tell if someone is okay with you doing X, Y, or Z. Like your their body, even if they're not telling you, is going to say yes or no. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, even just, uh, you know, I've been married uh, 20 years at this point. I can't imagine like, you know, trying to, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, with my wife, like here, here's a contract I'd like you to sign for tonight of all the things that, you know, here, step by step, you know, sign, initial here, initial there as we go through, you know, it's just not how people work, uh, you know, to some extent. And if you have this sort of vibe that you need that in order to engage in an activity, you know, again, I'm not from that generation, but it feels or it looks from the outside like it's just made this very frightening or very scary. Uh, and at least some of the ways I see some people talk about it. Now, there's, again, there's, there's some young people that are having sex and enjoying themselves. I don't want to make it sound like it's everybody. Uh, but there does seem to be, again, kind of a subset of, of young people that really seem to be struggling around, you know, incorporating their developing sexuality into their identity and and uh, into their social, you know, relationships with other people. And, um, and again, I think maybe the pendulum swung a little bit too far into, you know, making things sound scarier than they usually are for most people. Did you read The Boy Crisis? I don't think I read that one. Oh, my gosh. I highly recommend it to everyone. Like, even if you don't have children or if you don't have a son, it's just a really interesting insight into kind of where we are societally and even globally. But they were bringing up statistics about Japan specifically. And it's like the average age of someone losing their virginity in Japan is like 30 years old. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So like they are not having sex. And um, I think it's them and Korea, like obviously South Korea, um, are going through kind of like what's the word? Uh like I guess depopulation. Like they're just yeah. not having children either. So they're getting married super late. And then obviously there's the question about fertility once you're not even getting married until like you're in your thirties. So then you're just yeah. like gonna have these races that just kind of disappear because of I would assume fear around sex and lack of purpose. And um, it gets into a lot of a lot of problems with boys. And it, uh, he has a whole section on um, school shootings in there as well. And he kind of correlates it to the lack of father figure in the house. He does get into some mental health issues, mm-hmm. which is interesting because we don't ever hear that brought up we don't hear oh well um he was schizophrenic or he was whatever whatever antisocial we he was we don't hear that side of it and i think it's because we don't want to de we don't want to stigmatize mental health but it's like to yeah. what cost like if this is, if there's a problem and we are all on board with um lowering yeah. gun violence i don't think anyone is like yes i want more of that everyone is like, <laughs> this is a problem how do we solve it we have to be honest about all of the contributing factors so if we're just saying oh it's hollywood or um or it's porn or it's you know xyz but we're not being honest about everything that's going on biologically with this person and even within their own home like are they getting beat at home do they not have a father do they not have a mother are they getting bullied at school like what are all of the contributing factors to this this um this person doing a, hor- a horrific act and you see it too um and i guess like sorry to bring it up but it just seems like i can't stop but see like the parallels because it's when people are involved with sexual violence or human trafficking they automatically blame porn and it's like mm. well that seems like a really big leap to me i think that there's a lot of underlying issues that we're not talking about and why are we not talking about them yeah well, I, I think that like you said a lot of it does come down to the you know the politics. So you know on the on the right, you know um, you you'll see people who don't want to talk about gun control, so they'll talk about the video games. And you know this is one thing that I did criticize President Trump in writing 
uh, for if we ever, if we ever really, by the way, do end up with a fascist government in the U.S., I'm doomed. I'm the, the first one at, at, at the wall is going to get shot. Uh, I've, I've written too many things down <laughs> to, to, to deny them at this point. Uh, but I, I, obviously, I don't think that's actually where we're going. I think there's a lot of hyperbole around that. But yeah, I mean, so there's there's that sense on like on the right, people don't want to talk about like any kind of gun control sort of stuff. And I understand some of the reasons why they're suspicious, you know, about the left's views on that and it would help if people on the left wouldn't say yes literally we're going to come take your guns away right first off but that's another another <laughs> discussion um but um yeah i think with you know the both the mental health and the fatherlessness issue yeah i think this it, all these things come down to like uncomfortable truths that we don't want to talk about on one side or the other i mean on the right, of course, having lots of guns around is going to contribute to the homicide rate. You know, uh, you know, it's hard to deny that on some level. And I, I don't advocate a UK, Australia, like take everybody's guns away sort of response to that. But but we ought to be at least able to say that this is a contributing factor on some level. On, on the other hand, of course, mental health increases people's risk for violence. You know, we, we, this, this is very, very clear in the literature. Um, so there is this weird sort of like thing on the left where they're very worried about stigmatization of the mentally ill. And I get it because, you know, that that certainly is a real concern. But you can't lie. You know, there, there are ways of discussing this issue. You point out like most mentally ill people don't commit violent crimes. There is an elevated risk. Um, they are not bad people. They literally don't understand what they're doing. You know, and if maybe and if you deny that there's any link whatsoever, you actually remove any impetus for society to be concerned about this, you know, in the sense of, well, then why should we bother buying, buying or building mental health facilities? If they don't hurt us, you know, because people tend to respond better to incentives that benefit themselves. So if you're saying we should build mental health centers because it will benefit the mentally ill, that's not a persuasive argument. Um, If, on the other hand, you say we should build mental health centers so some of them won't attack you. That's a persuasive argument is the reality of it. And people will make decisions that are self-interested, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and same thing with the fatherless stuff. I think with the fatherless, once again, the evidence is pretty clear that lack of a father figure in a family um, is associated with a host of negative outcomes for both boys and girls, but particularly boys, mm-hmm. including crime, right? You know, uh, but there again, I think people are concerned about stigmatizing single mothers because of course you know they're working hard they're doing their best there's no doubt that that is true um there are some racial disparities in fatherlessness so people feel like well if we point out that fatherlessness is particularly high in one community versus another one that that is going to promote racial stigma or something of that sort you know but again i think that you can't lie though i mean there are ways of trying to you know give a nuance and complicated argument of saying like these things are true but that doesn't mean like everybody in this community comes from a fatherless home or that, you know, certainly you know, their fatherlessness exists in, you know, most ethnic communities at different levels, you know, um, you know, so there are ways I think are handling that, that reduce the potential for racial stigma or stigma uh, towards the mentally ill or whatever. But what seems to happen is people are just like, like you said, either ignoring the issue whatsoever pretending it doesn't exist or, or lying about it. I imagine but lying is hard. Maybe people believe their own narrative. I don't know. But with the mental mental illness stuff, they're, you know, but what they're saying is certainly not true, um, that there's no link between mental illness and, um, you know, and, and criminal violence, for instance. So, but, but I think these things actually end up not helping the communities that they're supposedly defending, you know, so it's making it harder for the mentally ill to get services. It's making it harder to intervene in lower income communities where fatherlessness tends to be very high. If you don't, you know, maybe there are ways we can promote fatherlessness, but if you don't acknowledge that it's a problem, then nobody's going to tackle it. Uh, And that's not helping those people. I totally agree. I think it could, because until you, until you start lifting out the layers and seeing what's really underneath all of this, you can't even start to formulate a plan or a solution to anything. And if you have these kids that are hurting, it's that old adage that hurt people hurt people. Well, if we don't know what we're looking for, how do we help them before they hurt other people? And then this thing just keeps perpetu- perpetuating. And then you see 
also, and I think that this is one of those things where we talk about the pendulum going too far. It's like this rehabilitation idea with kids. So Mm -hmm. one argument that I've seen is that these kids will start to show antisocial tendencies like that are getting them suspended after like, you know, one time after another after another. And instead of doing an expulsion or maybe um, some other intervention, they're just like, we're just going to keep putting a bandaid on it. And then all of a sudden this really troubled kid who's just been rehabilitated instead of like. I don't want to say treated, but for lack of better words, treated, nurtured, cared for, and repaired um, ends up in a situation that could have been preventable. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the reality is is that we really don't have an effective intervention system for mental health at any level. Whether we're talking about school kids are starting to show problems, you know, behavior problems in schools, which you know, I don't work in the schools, but I'm hearing a lot of reports suggesting that teachers are really having a tough time of it right now because there are so many kids. You know, but maybe particularly post COVID that are really struggling with developmental behavioral problems and this sort of stuff. And kind of consistent with what you said, that the teachers feel defanged, you know, that the administration is really not supporting them with these kids. Um, you know, but also, you know, with adults, you know, that, that if you have someone who has schizophrenia, you know, or whether they're a minor or an adult, there's really not much support. Um, for these um, these people, you know, and so they end up homeless or, you know, unemployed or, yeah, they're in really bad outcomes for these people. And, you know, I, I am, I'm sort of an advocate for this idea. We really need to start developing some kind of state sponsored long term inpatient type care for people that are really showing like I'm sort of familiar with the Nicholas Cruz case, you know, to, to some extent, I actually, you know, consulted for a while with the prosecution in that case. But there's a situation where he had an individual who throughout his his lifespan, I mean, just showed problem after problem after problem, you know, way back to elementary school. And uh, at some point you kind of think like this person really needed to be in a facility, you know, where, the, where they he could get care. Um, he was separated from society, so he wasn't a danger to other kids or young adults or, you know, whatever else. Um, now, of course, the problems are, are several. One, you have, somebody has to pay for this, right? You know, so there's going to be more taxes. That's going to be an argument you have to try to sell to the general populace of voters. Two, you have to make sure there's good due process in these facilities so people aren't just being locked away forever with no chance of resuming uh, normal life if they get better. And also you have to make sure the care is humane, right? You know, uh, that is the best standard of care, evidence-based medicine, uh, not like what happened in like the 1920s, you know, in asylums, which is oftentimes very cruel uh, and not very effective. So, so there are a lot of, I think, cognitive blocks to why people are hesitant to recreate some sort of, for lack of a better word, asylum system. Um, but I think really at some point we're going to have to acknowledge that we have to have some kind of long-term care we can definitely do it a lot better than historically long-term care looked like uh, in the United States or anywhere else. Um, but right now what we're doing is not working. Some of these individuals are committing crimes. Uh, the others, even if they're not committing crimes, a lot of them end up homeless or drug addicted or alcohol addicted or have a variety of other problems. And, you know, we, we can go to any big city and we can see people with obvious schizophrenia just walking around. And they're not all, most of them aren't hurting anybody, but, I don't know that just leaving them on the streets, the right choice either. Exactly. You know, so, and sure, maybe most of them will never be violent, but you can make, I think to voters, you make the argument of like, we'll just, you know, if we can just get all these people help, you know, which may be long-term inpatient care, some of them might've been violent, you know, and though we won't ever know who was who, uh, but that might reduce at least a few incidents. It won't clear up like gang violence, but you know, it, it might clear up a few acts of violence. And that's probably good for those people that, are now not going to be victims of crime, you know, because these people are getting the care that they need in these facilities. But we'll see. Once I become Grand Pooba, they'll make I'll make these changes. But uh. <laughs> no, it's interesting that you nailed it. I mean, there is no, there's kind of no early intervention. And the interesting thing is, is almost all you know, mass shooters or um, like perpetrators of of violent crimes are men. Or young boys, right? Like it's it's heavily male dominated when it comes to that. Yet when it comes to um, like any early interventions or any state run programs or gov- government run programs, like everything's for females. Like mental health mm. care is for females. But and it's not to say that you know we don't need it and like it's a one gender thing. But it's to say like if we're if we're trying to make the biggest impact on violence and you want to catch it early, you need to have programs that are geared towards men. 
and you need to have, you know, if they if they don't have the resources for it, you need to have some kind of um, grant for that and just like awareness brought to it and education through schools and community like communities like church and whatever you have. But right now everything is geared towards women. And that was brought up too in that book, um, which is so interesting. It's like almost like we don't want to solve the problem. It's like, okay, we have this thing, like at least step in early because that's when you're going to yeah. make a difference. And did you ever read, um, I think it's called Just Babies, Good versus Evil. Did you read that one when it came out? I have not, but I'm convinced that all babies are evil. Sure. <laughs> oh, well, I've been to the playground and I've seen some horrific children there for sure. Um, but it's the idea of like if you're born like good or bad essentially and they've They've tried to show studies of um, early babies actually being able to detect empathy or like good and good and yeah. right and wrong, essentially. And obviously, you're trying to superimpose your the way that you see it onto them because they can't speak. They're all nonverbal. But essentially, they have exercises of, you know, shapes pushing a ball up a, up a hill. And then you have one shape that's, you know, trying to push it back down and like cause problems. And then they kind of avoid that shape. So they're like, well, are they just avoiding it? Or do they really understand like good and evil? But um, they get into the case of this one little kid who just seemed to be very violent at a very early age, like mm. he was five or something. And he is like using pen pencils as weapons and stabbing other kids in the Ooh. face. And you're like, yeah. whoa, that's a little bit elevated. So it's the idea of do you think that some people are inherently born with empathy and not because the I guess like the the conversation is that so sociopaths and psychopaths don't have empathy. Correct. And it's like one in 25 is supposed to be a sociopath or a psychopath. So if that many people don't have empathy. Does that mean that they can't be fixed? Because there is that that story that the personality disorders can't be fixed. Yeah, and that's all pretty accurate. Yes, yeah, about 4% of men have antisocial personality disorder, uh, maybe about 1% of women. Um, but there's also a different personality disorder called borderline personality disorder which really just looks like the female version of antisocial. And that's, again, maybe about 3% of, of, of women and 1% of men have borderline personality disorder. But uh, so, yeah, you're probably about right. Somewhere around 4 to 5% of individuals have, you know, one of these uh, more aggressive personality disorders. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is genetic, you know, so not, not all of it is genetic, but, but a lot of it uh, does appear to be genetic. I mean, what we, you can, which is a little bit scary when you're thinking like of adopting children, by the way. But, you know, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, what you can kind of say is like if you have a child who has the genes that predispose them uh, to psychopathy, uh, then, you know, that seems kind of scary. But what can you do is like parents. Right. And it, and it still does matter the environment in which the person lives. You know, so what you can do is if you take your psychopath baby. Uh, that's just a weird thing to say, but yeah, psychopath baby. <laughs> and you give them an otherwise nurturing, loving, stable environment. They'll still grow up to be a psychopath, but they might be a lawyer, right? You know, they'll, they'll find some place where psychopathy actually works in society. And it does like law or business, um, you know, frontline combat troops, something like that, you know, volunteer frontline combat troops. Like that. There are places where that personality style actually is desirable, if you will, you know, and you don't want them to be like a therapist, right? You know, you are, or like a kindergarten teacher, you want them to be, you know, some of these other places. Um, on the other hand, if you neglect and abuse your psychopath, that's where you're likely to end up, you know, with someone who's, you know, going to be a criminal or something, something much worse. Um, so, you know, so if you take someone that doesn't have the predisposition, and you're nice to them, you know, they become a kindergarten teacher, if you're not so nice to them, they become an erotic kindergarten teacher, you know, but they're still going to be a kindergarten, you know, they're still not going to be a psychopath just because you abuse them. The same thing, if you have someone who's predisposed to psychopathy and you're nice to them, they become a lawyer or a police officer or something like that. And if you're not so nice to them, then they become, you know, the so it really is that sort of mixture of, you know, the genetics and the environment in which the person is raised that both have an influence. Uh, but you can't ever take your psychopath and be super, super nice to them and end up with a kindergarten teacher, right? You know, because because the genes do set the range of possible outcomes you can uh, you get from that person. But but yeah, they do show. I mean, you know, babies' temperaments are correlated pretty highly with adult personality. You know, so the the friendly, easy babies tend to be friendly, easy adults. The crabby, difficult babies tend to be crabby, difficult adults, and um, that's just kind of how it goes. You know, that's so, <laughs> so interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. P- personality is pretty is pretty stable, uh, even from early years. Now, of course, there is some variation, some flexibility in it in the early years. Uh, but usually, by the time we hit teenage years, I mean, you know, by the time you're 18, who you are is largely who you are. You know, there again, it's not that you don't change at all for the rest of your life. You do, um, but you're not going to change radically, you know? So if you're a, a jerk at 18, you're, you're going to be a jerk at 78, you know, as well. Maybe be a little bit more of a jerk, a little bit less of a jerk, but <laughs> you know, you're not going to suddenly become mother Teresa uh, or anything of that sort somewhere along, you know, unless you're visited by the ghost of Christmas past, present and future. It's really the only thing I've ever heard of that can change a personality radically or a head injury, I suppose could possibly do it. And some usually for the worst though. Um, so yeah, you're kind of stuck with yourself. That's, that's the, yeah. Uh, for some people, the downside of, of having a personality disorder, you know, people that are have some personality disorders like narcissistic or histrionic or even antisocial don't really care. They're, they're happy to have them. Um, but, you know, if you have a personality disorder that's more aversive for you as an individual, then it is a struggle. I mean, because, you know, it may be causing you some problems. You don't like that aspect of yourself, but it's actually very, very hard to change. Um, any aspect of the personality once someone is, is entered, you know, adolescence or certainly adulthood. Yeah, I was going to ask. So is the reason that personality disorders can't be fixed because they don't want to fix them or because it's just we haven't cracked that code yet? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it, I, I don't know what it would take. There, there really isn't anything to fix them, you know. So personality seems to crystallize to a large degree. Again, I, I, I won't say 100 percent, you know, because there is still some change that occurs later in life. But mm-hmm. um, to, a, to a great degree, our personalities harden, if you will, you know, by the time we're in adolescence and young adulthood, which and yeah, there are a lot of people that have like like one is basically called avoidant personality disorder, which is just means that they're super shy, like pathologically shy. Um, and they're mis- you know, oftentimes they're very miserable. They, they don't want to be shy right? because they're missing out on romantic partners or not. They don't have as many friends. They're less likely to get married. All kinds of like negative things happen to them. They, they, they're, they're not avoidant because they don't want these relationships. They do, but they just are so anxious. It's, it's not even just regular. Anxiety. It's like a personality level of anxiety that happens around this. And they would love to not be so shy. Uh, but unfortunately, there isn't like a really great fix uh, for that. So with a lot of these things, you can try to come up with workarounds, you know, for, for, for people like maybe they're, especially now in today in modern society, maybe they're more comfortable with like, you know, an online dating app or something of that sort than they would be meeting people in person or whatever. Um, same thing with like borderline personality disorder, which is marked by self-destructive behavior and impulsivity and self-mutilation and aggression. Um, the, the things that they do to treat that don't, take the borderline personality disorder away, but instead of so having to do stuff like instead of cutting themselves, you know, which of course can leave scars or can get infected. Uh, they'll tell them to do things like pour henna tattoo uh, wax on their skin and then rip it off, which hurts as much as the cutting does, but doesn't cause any scarring. doesn't actually cause an injury or anything of that sort. So you're basically shifting the person's, you know, pathology from something that's going to harm them to something that's going to harm them much less. Uh, and those are the, the workarounds sometimes people will try to figure out for, for personality disorder. So you're, you still have borderline personality disorder, uh, but you have a few mechanisms in place um, to, uh, you know, th- think of like someone has memory loss, right? And starts using like little stickies everywhere to mem- remember things. It's kind of the same thing, right? You're coming up with little adaptations to try to help the person uh, to, um, you know, work around whatever deficits they may have in their personality. But the personality itself doesn't really change much. Uh, across. I, w- I wish I could say it was different. You know, I, w- I mean, that's, I understand that's not a very optimistic message for some people, but and I wish it was different for people that are suffering with, with personality disorders. But, um, but the reality is that they don't really change. It's sort of like intelligence. Intelligence doesn't really change across the lifespan either. You know, you can buy all the books about how to improve your IQ you want. And the reality is, is if, you, if you test it as an IQ of 110 when you were five, you're going to die with an IQ of about 110. You know, there's not a whole lot that you can do uh, to to change that over the lifespan. No, I think that's important to hear, though, because if, if you find yourself in a relationship with someone who either, like, let's say, is a narcissist personality, or if you have um, a parent that's borderline, or you're in a relationship with someone that's borderline, I think it can be really easy to try to like 
fix, like constantly try to fix, 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 and like they'll change, they'll change. But I think it's good. Again, it goes back to like not lying and having honest conversations yeah. of where that threshold of change can happen. Like like you said, like you can improve, but it's never going to completely go away. So you have to know exactly what you're dealing with before you can be like, I'm on board with this relationship. Yeah. Well, it's, it seems like you know, some people even seem to purposely pick romantic partners to fix, you know? So the, I, I hear like, I, I like a partner with a challenge is kind of like the, the narrative uh, that, that, that I've heard sometime. And I'm going to start sounding a little bit Freudian, but I'm really not a Freudian uh, psychologist at all. But there, it, you know, there seems to be this element of, I, I call it the all men are assholes effect. Uh, just because it's uh, kind of fun to put that in that gender direction. Now, now, of course, men do this as much as women. So it's not really trying to pick on women, but yeah, I, I hear a lot of women say things like all men are assholes. And what it really kind of boils down to is, what they're really saying is all men that I choose to date are assholes, you yeah. know? Uh, and uh, because they oftentimes will say this to me and I'm a guy and I, well, and they say, Oh no, 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 not you. You're, you're, you're in the friend zone. You know, you're okay. <laughs> you're different, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I, I one time had this, you know, I'm going to tell a really quick story. I one time had this friend um, in graduate school who uh, was in this long relationship on and off again, like for like a year and a half and just broke up, got back together, broke up, got back together. Really dysfunctional. There's no abuse or anything like that. But other than that, which is emotionally dysfunctional. So she eventually dumped the guy and went out then on a date with another guy. And the guy that she went out on a date with, uh, she was just telling me the story the, the night after or the morning after. Uh, was a doctor, medical doctor. First off, he showed up like in a Mercedes. He brought her flowers, like held the door open for, her, uh, you know, held seat. There was a perfect gentleman. He was handsome, like tall, dark, and handsome kind of a thing. Brought it, brought her out to a nice restaurant. They had, you know, he was charming. They had a great time. He made her laugh. He was funny. He was uh, as, as she was petted. Yeah, he, was a, he was a good guy. He was a nice guy. He was funny. He was smart. He was a nice, nice guy. And I said, you're not going out with him again, are you? Uh -uh. <laughs> and she said, no. And I asked her, why? I don't want to go out with him <laughs> at this point. And, uh, and, uh, and she said, well, I, and she, and she kind of stumbled. She kind of said, well, I don't know. It just didn't kind of click. And I, I said, yeah, what it was. He was too nice. You know? And she said, yeah, that's exactly what it was. And I think that's where she said something like, I need to feel like I have a bit more of a challenge, you know, or something of that sort. Um, so it seems to be, this is where the Freudian thing comes in is like sometimes you look into like the backgrounds of, of people that say that and men do it too. I, I'm trying to make it clear. I'm not really picking on women here. Uh, men do it too, of course. But, um, you know, it's in essence that Freud would say that, you know, that, that these people are really trying to recreate a parent child relationship that was dysfunctional and they're trying to fix it symbolically with a romantic partner. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily true or not, but, uh, but oftentimes you do find the people that do that pattern that do actually have some problems with their parents uh, at some point. So. That, for sure. I think there's something to that. And I also think what I hear with those types of relationships, and I have been guilty of that 100% when I was younger, <laughs> is like purposely picking the wrong guy, is that if you have a lot of instability and, and chaos in your home growing up, that mm -hmm. you confuse that for a spark and a romantic partner. So if everything is calm and if everything yeah. is healthy, you're like, I, like this is so uncomfortable for me because that's not what I'm used to. I'm used to chaos. So you have to have chaos and then you confuse that as a spark when really that's just unhealthy, an unhealthy dynamic. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I try to tell like, you know, I, I tell these stories in my classes. I tell the women in my classes, like I hear a lot of young women say that they uh, will date a man for his potential. And I'm really here to say that men have no potential. <laughs> um, like <laughs> what, you, what you're seeing on the first date is as good as it is going to ever get because our effort is at 100 percent. And that 100 percent is going to fall like a mountain side <laughs> from that point on. Uh, so things are not going to get better than than the first date so if you think you're seeing potential you're you're really reading too much <laughs> into the into the situation but uh, yeah that's just kind of how it works out but so i i hope i hope that i've like uh, you know changed people's lives <laughs> by, by clearing them into this sort of phenomenon before they delve into themselves too far down the line so yeah try to find a nice person male or female yeah. uh gay or straight i don't care if I, you know find someone you actually get along with peacefully because a spark, sparks never last anyway. So you want someone who's going to be like your best friend. Yeah, you know? exactly. So how long have you been married? I've been married 20 years and I am married to my best friend. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So we're going on our seventh year of marriage and then together for like 
12 or something. It took him a long time. But yes, yeah. <laughs> together for like 12. Um, and yeah, the, you, the spark is just – I've had – um, I've read books where it breaks down the exact neurochemistry of what that excitement is in the beginning yeah. stage. And it like cannot last past something like three months. Like That's the average – bell curve of that spark and all of that excitement and the random passion and all of that. So unless you want a series of three month relationships, you have to be able to go past that spark anyways. So it's how do you create that? And Esther Perel is one of my favorite people when it comes to like recreating that spark and keeping the passion alive in your relationship because that's different than a spark, the whole love story versus a life story. A love story is super exciting and erotic. But that's not that's going to fizzle out hard and quick. Yeah. You have to have s- uh, someone that you can build that life story with. Yeah. Yeah. When, you, when you're falling in love, you're really falling in love with an adventure, not a person, you know. And uh, when you actually begin to truly love someone is when you kind of realize like, well, this person's got some good stuff and this person's got some flaws, but their flaws are really not that bad. I can live with them and I really like the good stuff about them. So on balance, you know, they are adding positively to my life. I believe that I'm adding positively to their life. This is a good partnership. You know, we can, you know, go through all the different travails of life. And I believe this person has my back. I believe I have the ability to have their back if, if they need it. And that's really what a healthy relationship, I think, yeah, in my opinion, um, really, really looks like. But yeah, you have to be okay with that or actually I, I think it's better i mean i you know like i said we've been married 20 years uh she's definitely my best friend it's nice to have a best friend i can bring with me everywhere i go as i've moved over the years so um that that is super super cool and and i would say like you know life has its ups and downs and i can't imagine having gone through the last 20 years without having uh my wife diana uh in it you know because there have been some significant downs and my dad died and the you know career was stressful at different points and not having that support that she was able to offer. Yeah. I, I would be a fraction of the person I was today uh, without that. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, I've been able to do the same for her because of course it definitely is a two way street. It shouldn't all be about like what the person does for you, but also what you can do for that other person. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but that's not usually how we're thinking in those first, like you said, first three months or so it's really about, this is fun. I'm on a roller coaster, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> but you don't really want to like take the roller coaster with you everywhere you go, you know, necessarily. So even if it is a fun ride for a while. No, exactly. Cause that's not the thing that gets you through those real, like those life moments, right? Like you're going to lose a parent at some point or both parents and you're going to probably have to move and lose jobs and have all of these unpredictable downs and you need someone that's like a a stable, reliable um, force that you can kind of lean on. Like your your passions aren't going to get you through that or your excitement or your like really hot kiss. You know what I mean? Like that's fun, but you don't confuse the two. Yeah. And at some point you're going to be 70, you know, so... (laughs) You have to build a structure relationship that's going to sustain you at that point, you know, and uh, and hopefully we all are still having sex at 70. Right. You know, because it's, it's good for the heart. It's good for a lot of things. Right. You know, so I'm not trying to say you can't have any passion when you're 70. Um, but, you know, um, life would be a lot different then. And you want someone that, you know, you can enjoy not just the moment you're in at, at any given time, but also you can really think of like, I'm OK with spending not just the past 20 years, but the next 20 years um, with this person as well. You know, and I'm looking forward to that. You know, if, you, if, if you're struggling and thinking like, oh my God, can I picture being with this person when we're 75 and one of us maybe is on a CPAP machine or something like that? I don't know. Is, am I still going to be turned on? You know, um, then, um, yeah, you might want to think, you know, something you just want to think about is like, does this, this is have a long-term potential or, or not? And yeah, just being, on adrenaline the whole time is it's not, you can't do that for 40 years. Uh, you can do it, like I said, maybe three months, maybe six months if you really get a lot of energy, but, mm-hmm. um, and it, eventually it, ha- it just, it just has to shift to some other kind of platform for sustaining a long-term relationship. So mm-hmm. you want someone who could be, they could be your friend, uh, yeah, more than anything else, really. I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, so what is it that you're working on right now? Well, yeah, so I'm still doing video game stuff. Uh, I'll probably be doing video game stuff until I die. Um, <laughs> it's fun. It's easy. My university keeps buying me video game machines. Uh, there's really no downside to it. Um, so we're actually looking right now in our lab, we're looking at a study, of, looking at sort of race um, and in video games. Um, so, of course, yeah, a lot of what I'm doing now, I've picked up on the whole 2020 narrative, um, that kind of stuff. So we're, we're basically, although I don't think it's going to 
we're going to see anything, you know, honestly, but we're having people play two different versions of resident evil, which if you're not familiar with is a zombie shooting game. Um, and in one of the games, the zombies are mostly African and the other, they're mostly white, you know, and then we have, I have several student art research assistants working with me. Half of them are black, half of them are white. And so they're, they're also randomized. So when a participant comes and runs through the experiment, they're randomized to play one of the two games, but they're also randomized to get one of the two, one of these research assistants. They work in partners, you know, pairs, basically. So usually one of them will run them through the experiment. And at the end of the experiment, they're given an opportunity to be mildly aggressive. And I mean, I put someone's hand in a bucket of ice water. We can't have anybody knife each other in the lab, of course. But, you know, uh, so we're very mild aggression towards another person. Um, so we want to see, like, you know, the whole idea is if, do the people who are playing the game who are shooting Africans, black zombies, essentially, are they more aggressive to the black student, you know, when they have, or vice versa? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we haven't run the data yet, so we don't know what the outcome. My research assistants have the impression that the game probably doesn't matter, and, and that if anything, people are meaner to the white women than the black women, but we'll see how that all works out. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm also doing some stuff on, on like more generally on like race and policing and crime using some like government data sets and, and things like that. And so far the short version seems to be that again, I was sort of excited by this 2020 narrative. It looked a lot like the video game narrative where people were making these kind of like big moral claims about stuff that, you know, at least from my understanding, things were a lot more complicated than what was being said mm-hmm. uh, around in the news media in 2020 around policing and race and this kind of stuff. And sure enough, that's kind of what we're seeing is that if you look at like, you know, police misconduct certainly does happen, but the bigger predictors of police misconduct seem to be stuff like community level mental health, like class issues, you know, poverty, but also, you know, the more mentally ill people you have in a community, the more police misconduct you have, not so much race. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems like it's a legitimate issue in some respects, but the narrative in 2020 might have focused in on the wrong variable um, as the one to, to, to highlight, to try to reduce some of these. And what it really comes down to is police officers are not well trained in crisis de-escalation. You know, so if you have, they're trained, generally speaking, like if someone is doing something wrong, to escalate, to yell at the person. And for most of us, if a police officer yells at us, we comply because we, you know, we're scared. Uh, for someone with schizophrenia, um, they don't know what's going on. So they escalate right along with the officer, right? You know, um, and that's where you end up with some of these bad situations. So uh, it probably would help if police officers had better mental health de-escalation, crisis de-escalation training so that they don't end up turning some of these you know, like, you know, some of these cases, the, the person's initial crime was something minor. I fell asleep in a drive through at a restaurant, you know, that kind of stuff. Nobody deserves to die for that. Mm-hmm. So how do you then, if you get into that situation and that person's agitated, how do you calm them down um, while still doing your duty uh, so that that situation doesn't escalate? So, so I think we need that, you know, and to talk about that. But of course, what we actually did talk about in 2020 probably made things a lot, you know, the whole defund the police sort of thing made things a lot worse. We've seen escalating homicide rates, you know, in a lot of cities, um, most of which are hit, you know, lower income uh, communities. Um, So there again, you know, sometimes people get ahead of the data and uh, just, you know, this is a much bigger issue than video games, but uh, sometimes when we get ahead of the data, we make decisions that are going to hurt people, not help people. Yeah. So how does, and maybe this is like an abstract question, but how does a regular person who's not trained in clinical research know what data is legitimate? Because you can always use statistics or information to kind of um, like prove your argument if you want, if you're if you're sly about it. So like, what are you supposed to kind of look for? Or is it just kind of having like an open mindset and saying like the, a, a healthy skepticism to like, this might be incorrect? Yeah, that's a great question. I, mean, I, I would say like for people as individuals, if you kind of think like the more emotionally sure you are of something, the less likely you are to be correct. Like if it upsets you to think about being wrong about something, mm-hmm. you probably have gone off the rails. <laughs> and we all do it. We're all human. I'm not, you know, but you know, sometimes we all get agitated by like, no, the Democrats are definitely right, you know, all the time. <laughs> You know, the, without exception, um, you know, we all have these moments, you know, but the more like you feel yourself just getting like upset about the possibility that the data may be more nuanced or complicated than what you think. 
uh, is probably a hint for yourself that you maybe are just not as open minded about that topic. Uh, you know, again, I don't claim to be immune to this. You know, this is a very human way of being. Uh, as far as the, you know, listening to, obviously, we, we know news media are, are full of crap. I mean, it's, it's, I, I wish I had a, a sense of like, other than being like generally trying to tap back into a sense of critical thinking, um, which doesn't really guide us towards the truth as much as being aware that we might not be hearing the truth, which at least is the first step, I right. guess. Mm-hmm. Um, um, the, the reality is right now we're living in a, in a moment where everybody's kind of full of crap. You know, uh, news media, politicians, even professional guilds like the American Psychological Association are just terrible sources of information. I wish I could tell you, like, oh, just go to go to <laughs> go to my website. That's where all the truth is. Uh, there, there is no single source that you can definitively go to. The the one thing we find in research is that people who listen to both sides, you know, quote unquote, both sides tend to be the best informed. So, in other words, like thinking in terms of news media. The people who are the best informed are the ones who listen to both left news media like CNN or MSNBC and listen to Fox News or anything else on the right. So by getting both sides of it, they sometimes end up in a place that is a bit more consistent with where the data actually are. But of course, that takes a bit more time and investment um, you know, to get there. But in general, I think what happens is um, we tend to trust authorities more than we really should. And so if we, we if we read something in the news media, whatever it may be, we oftentimes just have no idea, you know, what the truth is. You know, so we have no real way of testing for ourselves whether what we're hearing is true or not. Uh, you know, thinking like global warming. I mean, I personally believe that, you know, humans are contributing to it, but I don't know. I, I, I've never seen any of the data. And I wouldn't know how to read it. Uh, you know, so I have to have some trust uh, that authorities are not completely full of crap. But, you know, on the other hand. It does help to understand that climate scientists are humans too, you know, and uh, can get stuck in their own rabbit holes sometimes. I, I, I would, I would love it if they were wrong. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that they are, but I, I would love it if they were wrong. But yeah, I think that sense of having a healthy skepticism, you don't want to go completely tinfoil hat, you know, mm-hmm. and like you know reject science and go to YouTube instead. That's not healthy either. But, but having a healthy skepticism, particularly if a message seems out to be sounding scientific but really is moral is a moral message that's being sort of wrapped up in some numbers then that's when you really should be like really really sensitive to the idea you might be getting some bad information even if it sounds like scientists the idea that you know here's a science and you're a bad person if you don't sort of follow along with the narrative that we're selling you uh you're anti-science and just morally corrupt somehow that's probably a warning sign that you're getting some sense of like, you know, you're being misled uh, to some extent. No, that's really good because I feel like any of the arguments that I can think of off of the top of my head, that's exactly where they led was um, really trying to get you with your emotions and then link it right back to a morality. And it's like these things are not linked. Like morality has nothing to do whether this causes this. Like those are two separate issues and you're allowed to have your opinion, but don't confuse that with science and, and hard yeah. data. Yeah. And I, I guess too, if you're hearing like, you know, two different messages that are somehow mutually exclusive, but it's all, the one I think of is like, you know, on the, on the left, I'm sure, again, there are examples on the right too. And I'm, I wish I could balance them a little bit better, but I, I live in lefty spaces. So that's also why I have more examples from there. But, um, but the one of like, there was a, yeah, the controversy being ongoing about like critical race theory in schools. And so you hear this like narrative of, oh, we're not teaching critical race theory in schools, but if we are, it's good, you know? Yeah. And that's like, like two, like, like, well, which one is it? You know, pick one. They can't both be true. And that's, and that's, and that's a weird defense, you know, of, a, you know, the Republicans might be wrong about a lot of this stuff. I'm open to that. You know, I don't, and again, I don't actually approve of their solutions to a lot of the issues around CRT in schools, but you know, that defensive, like we're not teaching it, but if we are, it's good. <laughs> it's, just a, it's a really, really weird narrative for a, a defense. And that's where, again, maybe a red flag might come up of saying like something's something just sounds off here. Uh, and I don't think you're telling me the whole truth. And so uh, that might be, you know, just one example. And again, I'm sure there are other plenty of examples on the right that are exactly like that. I just don't happen to have one on, my, on the top of my head. No, no, you're told you're totally right. And I think it's just, again, it's not conflating like science with morality. And it's like, whose job is it to teach any of these things to our kids? Like, I, I wouldn't want my kid going to a school and then all of a sudden I find out they take him and they're trying to teach him um, like hardcore 
Catholic views, right? Because that's those aren't the views that we have in my household. It's not to say right. like I don't respect anyone that's Catholic. Absolutely, I respect your choice of religion, but that's not for my family and my household, and that's not your job as a state employee <laughs> is to indoctrinate yeah. my child into into Catholicism. So it's it's yeah. not like a a bigoted thing to say like I don't want my kid learning CRT. It's like, well, whose job is it to teach right and wrong and morality and how not to be racist? Like, I mean, that's most people agree. Like, obviously, racism is horrible, but the way that it's all framed right now is also not right. Like, you can't say just generalize based off of skin pigment whether or not you're oppressed or not. Like, that's wild too. So it's like everything just seems to be such an extreme these days like we can't just like settle in the middle of this pendulum swing it's like crash into one wall that's wrong crash into the other wall until like both sides are equally damaged just doesn't make any sense to me it does yeah absolutely yeah and it you know it it, it reminds me too of the whole teen sex thing where you know we used to be complaining about like teens were having too much sex and now they're not having enough but it's like it wasn't 10 years ago people were complaining, parents aren't involved enough in schools. <laughs> now now people are saying parents are too involved in schools. <laughs> parents are now ter- extreme terrorists or whatever. the Domestic terrorists. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was actually a thing. People tried to yeah. label oh my- parents complaining as domestic terrorists, you know. Uh, which again, maybe that's a little bit too far. Uh, again, I'm not. I, I'm. I'm certain that some of these parents are behaving badly in some of the school meetings. I'm open to that as a likelihood. Right. Uh, but we already have laws for threats or assaults. Right. And we don't need to, to get the FBI involved <laughs> in that sort of stuff. So that's always a little bit sketchy. When we, I, I'm always worried in general, and I know again this is a both sides. I, I, I always piss everybody off because I'm a both sides of risk. Both sides hate both sides arguments. Um, but. Um, yeah, I always, I always get worried when, and again, I've, you know, Trump did this and Biden has done it, you know, when the government, whoever's in charge of the government at the moment, vilifies half of the populace, you know, when you get a, a society that turns on itself, it's always a very dangerous thing. And, uh, and all these messages about the 47% or the 49% or the deplorables or the whatever the hell they are, the enemies of the state, you know, all this kind of stuff that goes back and forth is really a dangerous narrative. And this idea of pit, pitting people against each other on left or right, white or black, male, female, whatever it is, you know, trans or cis is really unhelpful. Um, and I wish I wish people that were in actual positions of power would, would kind of stop it. Um, but they're not for the moment. So. No, it's hard because when you know what you do about priming or trying to get someone to to see things in a very specific way, you can see what they're doing. Um, mm. But it's so hard if you're the one that's being primed to to notice it. And it's um, like, for example, in that Just Babies book, they did this one experiment where they had like um, they had the control group and then another group that they would bring the student out into the hallway and have them stand next to a, a hand sanitizer thing Mm. and they would ask them their their political views and their beliefs like on um like sexuality and if the kids Mm. that were standing next to the sanitizer leaned more conservative and more puritanical the kids that (laughs) were standing next to a trash can it's like that tiny little thing of just like where i place you and i ask you a question is going to influence your answer so we're just incredibly malleable and incredibly um, influenced and to deny that is a little bit silly Uh, and the people at the top aren't at the top for no reason like they're master manipulators and it's like just stop stop seeing as everyone as your enemy because they're not most people are in the middle they just want to take care of their family have a good day have a good home and just like not be bothered right Right, that's simple and everything else is a little bit crazy yeah well, like I said, when I become Grand Poobah, I'll figure out how to fix all this. Uh, I'll, look, I'll look forward to that day. <laughs> My benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> yeah. That's what Jocko, will, uh, Jocko will, and will, it's his, Willick says all the time. It's like he'd be a benevolent dictator. I'm like, that's the, yeah. Yeah, that's the only path to, uh, to fixing all of this mess. <laughs> I've been building my empire slow so far, but it's coming along. Yeah. One, one stone at a time. <laughs> um, well, this was really wonderful. It was great meeting you virtually. Do you want to tell the listeners where they can follow you um, and how they can support you in any way? Absolutely. You can send cash directly to me. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, I, I have I have a website which is very unimaginative. It's just my name. It's www.christopherjferguson.com. 
Um, I've also got a couple books on uh, Amazon. I've got one on, on video games, uh, Moral Combat, Why the War and Violent Video Games is Wrong, and a more recent one, How Madness Shaped History. So you can look. Uh, I got a couple of those on there, too. So uh, there's a few books to buy. Help, help put my kid through college. There we go. That's my, that's my pitch. <laughs> Do your part, people. Well, thank you so yeah. much. Well, thank you for having me on today. This has been a lot of fun. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Chatting with Candice. If you enjoyed the podcast and you want to show your support, share it with with a buddy, two or three on your social media. If it's been a while, please leave us a review. That helps us with the algorithms a ton. And if you want to support the podcast, you can go to chattingwithcandice.com. And there are multiple ways that you can support it via Buy Me a Coffee or Patreon. See you next time.